Last Sunday, I endeavored to preach some on the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'd like to go back this morning to Matthew chapter 16 to a statement that Jesus made in a conversation with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi. Verse 18 of Matthew 16, And Jesus said that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want you to notice that Jesus said, I will build my church. And he said he would do it himself. At that time, he had not built the church. But he was going to build it. During his public ministry, during his time on earth, he laid the foundation for the church and he began to build it. And I believe the church has been in the world ever since Jesus built it. It has not disappeared and then been resurrected. And the reason I say that is because Jesus said, The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He didn't say the gates of hell wouldn't try to prevail against it. We know that the devil has been trying to destroy the church for 2,000 years. We understand that. But it's been unsuccessful. Satan has done the church a lot of harm in places. And there are places where the church has died out. But it would rise up in other places. And so Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church. We believe Jesus is the rock, the unchanging rock, the foundation upon which the church was built. And that the gates of hell have not been able to prevail against it. And beloved, there was never anything like the church in the world. From the days of Adam in the Garden of Eden until Jesus came, there had never been anything like the church. There had been nations and empires. There had been the Jewish people in the land of promise. But there would never been anything like the church. The church was going to be very unique in all the world. First of all, it was not going to be associated with any particular land. It didn't have any geographical boundaries. The land of Israel did. But the church is not associated with any particular land. Furthermore, the church is not identified by any particular nationality or ethnicity. The church has been made up of people of all lands and colors and languages and tribes of the earth. The church was not going to be identified by a building like the temple in Jerusalem or like many man-made temples all over the ancient world. It was not going to be identified by a building erected by men. It would have no earthly headquarters. I've been asked the question a lot of times, where is the headquarters for the primitive Baptist church? And I've always said heaven. <laughs> because the Bible says that Jesus is the head of the body. And where is our head today? It's in heaven. We don't have an earthly headquarters like Rome or Salt Lake City or Mecca. No, the church, the headquarters for the church of Jesus Christ is in heaven. The church is not identified by any earthly man. The church has had a lot of good people in it through the centuries, men and women, boys and girls, who were faithful in their lifetime but they have all gone the way of all the earth. And this week, when I was so sick on Tuesday, I thought my time was about up. <laughs> I spent seven hours at the emergency room, and 
I was in one of those times where if the Lord had just said, come on home, Sam, that would have been fine. Y'all ever been that sick? That day will come with all of us in this house. But will the church end when we're gone? No. The church is not identified by any one earthly man on this earth like, say, the Pope or somebody like that. No. The, the church is unique. The church that Jesus built is very unique. It, it eventually would uh, travel to every continent on the face of this earth for which we are truly thankful. Now you may say, well, Brother Sam, how could the church survive for 2,000 years without a standing army, without a great big bank account, without seminaries to train our preachers? How could the church survive? Even the Babylonians didn't survive. That mighty empire represented by gold in Nebuchadnezzar's image. The Medes and the Persian Empire, a mighty empire, but they finally disappeared. The Greeks, the Romans. How is the church going to survive? How has it survived? And I want to say to you this morning, I believe it has survived by the extraordinary providence of God himself. Jesus has been watching over his church, and he's been taking care of it. And we bow before him today and praise him for that. And furthermore, I think it's very important for us who love the church to understand that the church of Jesus Christ, the church Jesus built, has never changed in its essentials. You say, now I just don't believe that, Pastor. I just don't believe the church hasn't changed. Well, it's changed in non-essentials, like where you meet, what time you meet, what songbook you sing out of. A lot of things like that have changed through the years, some for the better, some not for the better. But, but I want to tell you, in the essentials, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ has never changed. And he didn't call me to change it. <laughs> he called me to love it and to stand for it, to earnestly contend for it. Now, last Sunday, I briefly mentioned uh, something about the doctrine of the church that has never changed. And, and, you know, we could preach for months on the doctrine of the church. And if you're interested in knowing what uh, the old school Baptists believe we have our articles of faith, I think 12 of them, very simple statements of faith, starting out with the fact that we believe there is one true and living God made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Simple statement of faith. But if you really want to know what we believe in uh, two words, here it is, Jesus saved. <laughs> Some people say Jesus saves. No, when it comes to eternal salvation, he's already got that job done. And when did he do it? On the cross 2,000 years ago. Jesus saved. Past tense. And if that stirs up your imagination and you'd like to talk about that at lunch, I would be so glad to talk to you about that. But we don't want to go back you know, I love preaching on the doctrine, and I can very easily get <laughs> bogged down in preaching on doctrine. But also, the, 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 the doctrine of the church gives God all the glory. It doesn't share it with man at all. If you're looking for glory in a church, you don't belong among us. Because Jesus gets all the glory, right? From beginning to end, from A to Z. It's not about us. It's about him, and, and he gets all the glory, and we give him all the praise in his house. And the doctrine of the church gives Jesus Christ all the glory and all the praise. Now, the practice of the church was never designed to change. It's still very simple. I was talking to Brother Rejoice this morning, and uh, Brother Rejoice and I were talking about our service. I said, now, Brother Rejoice... We have a very simple service. 
And I said, if we do anything you don't understand, just ask me. Well, he didn't ask me anything. Because <laughs> everything we do here is pretty simple, isn't it? We sing. We take prayer requests. We pray. We preach. We shake hands. Period. <laughs> that's pretty simple, isn't it? And that's the practice of the church. And... Uh, and, and we love the simple practice of the church. And I don't believe that's changed in 2,000 years. Now, there have been people in the church that have tried to change it, but it didn't work. <laughs> it, it caused problems. And so uh, the practice of the church doesn't change at all. Furthermore, the discipline of the church has not changed for 2,000 years. You say, discipline? Wait a minute, I didn't, want to, I didn't want to join a church that's going to discipline me. Well, if you'll discipline yourself, the church won't have to discipline you. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> but you can't have anything without discipline. You can't have a home without it. You can't have a schoolroom without it. You can't have a business without it. You can't have a government without it. You cannot have a military without discipline, can you? And those of you who have served in the military know when, when the sergeant says, duck, <laughs> you duck, right? It, they don't take a vote on it. And he's doing that for your good, training you to survive. And you cannot have a church without Discipline. We're to behave ourselves in the house of God. That's what Paul told Timothy, to behave yourself in the house of God. And you know, I was blessed, and, and I know many of you here today are as old as I am, some of you older. And uh, I was blessed to come up in a little country school where they really believed in discipline. I don't know what would happen to the teachers that I went to today. I mean... <laughs> I guess they'd be fired, sent to jail or something. Martha Heldon was my first grade teacher. And uh, she was very strict. And I had no idea the woman loved me. <laughs> it never did show up <laughs> in my mind. And when I misbehaved, I'd have to hold my hand out. And she'd take a 12-inch ruler and blister it. Y'all ever been whipped like that? Now that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts bad. And my second grade teacher was even more of a disciplinarian, Miss, Miss Clara Porter. She loved me so much, she kept me in there two years. <laughs> I'm not sure it was love, <laughs> but she did me a favor by holding me back. Mama, I guess, wanted to get me out of the house as quick as she could. I started a little sooner than I could to school, but... But I tell you, our teachers, they, they run a tight ship. You can't learn where there is total chaos in the classroom. And, uh, and my, uh, I had a teacher named Ruby Maxwell. I'll tell you what now. Miss Ruby Maxwell brought a lot of culture to middle Georgia. She was a, she was a very cultured lady, highly educated. She dressed like a princess every day. She had perfect manners, perfect posture. She was a lady. I don't know how our school ever got her, but I'll tell you, she was something else. But let me tell you, she ran a tight ship now. She really did. One day I was supposed to get a whipping. I hate to tell you all this, but you know, your, your pastor's a sinner. And, and time ran out on her, and she couldn't give me my whipping that day. She said, I'll get you in the morning, Sammy. <laughs> So I came dressed for the paddling. <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> I had on about five pair of underwear, just to be honest with you. And the first lick, she knew what had happened. She sent me to the men's room to, <laughs> to get <laughs> properly dressed for the whipping. Uh, and Miss Ruby was tough. I tell you, we all, I mean, we, we, she, the earth trembled when that lady spoke. But what a blessing that woman was to us. And, and when, my, when my senior class voted for an outstanding teacher of the year, we chose Miss Ruby. You know why? She loved us. 
Don't tell me you love somebody if you don't hold them accountable. And I remember when I came back to Middle Georgia to preach one Sunday night for an appointment. She was sitting in the congregation on the second row. My, my friend, Gary Hall, had arranged for her to be there. Jimmy Carter was president of the United States at that time. Out of 10,000 times, rather had President Carter in the audience <laughs> than Miss Ruby Maxwell. I mean, that woman intimidated me. But she sat there and wept. And she asked me to conduct her funeral. <clears throat> I want to tell you, when you love people and you hold them accountable in love. Now, I'm not talking about mean-spirited and all of that. Uh, but, folks, uh, our church is to be a place of discipline. And we all should behave ourselves, right? I don't want this church having to discipline me in conference but if it, but it, let's say, God forbid, that I should rob a convenience store or a bank here in Birmingham, uh, you know what this church would do? <laughs> They'd probably call a special conference and exclude me from the fellowship of this church. And rightfully so, because I would have brought an awful reflection on the name of Jesus and on this church. Now, discipline doesn't mean we all go around with a magnifying glass looking at everybody. I don't want you doing me that way. <laughs> I don't even want my wife doing that to me. Uh, because I'm a sinner, I fail, I understand that. But no, we're not to be FBI agents and undercover agents and spying on one another. But beloved, we are to behave ourselves. We are to be Christian people. Is that not right? We are to try to live in such a way that our Lord Jesus Christ... And who would, who would want to belong to a church where you could just live any kind of life you wanted to live? Who, who would want to belong to a church like that? I wouldn't. That would not be the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul told the church at Corinth concerning a man who had committed a very awful sin, too shameful to even talk about. Paul said, you know... Uh, uh, it's been commonly reported that this man has done this. And when the church assembles together, you should withdraw from him. And so, yes, the church is, the, the discipline of the church has not changed through the centuries. Neither has the government of the church. You say, I didn't know our church had any government. Well, we do. <laughs> We're governed. And, and Jesus is in the executive office, and we're not going to have an election this week to decide who our head's going to be, right? Jesus is there, and he's in that office, and he'll be in that office until time is no more. He occupies the executive branch. There was a legislative branch made up of the apostles, and they wrote for us under divine inspiration this book. This very book that I have before me today. And this is our Constitution. And you and I are not allowed to add to it or to take away from it. You know, the Constitution of the United States of America, I believe, is a great Constitution, Brother Rejoice. <laughs> I, I really, you lived here seven years. You know how blessed we are as a nation under the constitution of our founding fathers. But our founding fathers knew they were not perfect, and so they left an open door to the constitution for amendments. And there have been some very good amendments made to our constitution that helped. But Jesus did not leave an open door to the Bible. As a matter of fact, he left a warning that if you add to or take away, then you'll be under judgment. This is a complete Revelation. So the legislature is closed, folks. When the apostles finished writing, when John finished writing the book of the Revelation, the word of God for us in, in, in a written form was completed, and we are to love it, and we are to live by it as his people. And, and ministers are called in a judicial way to interpret the word of God. And we are certainly answerable to the church. If we start trying to change things, then the church has a responsibility to call on us as the ministers of the gospel to, uh, you know, to get back on track. 
Paul told the churches of Galatia, he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from the gospel to another gospel, which is not the gospel, but a perversion of the gospel. And Paul was uh, holding them accountable. And so the church today has a simple, and, and, and when we want to do something here different, we take a vote by the congregation. We are actually uh, ruled by congregational vote. Now I want to just talk a moment this morning about the church of Jesus Christ and how it has got bogged down through the centuries. And one way the church has gotten bogged down is through traditions. Man-made traditions have hurt the church a lot through the centuries. And if we ever did anything, maybe out of necessity for a while, it becomes a kind of an unwritten rule that we have to keep doing it that way. I know Brother Sonny Piles told me one time, if old Baptists ever do anything twice in the same way, it becomes a tradition. And we can't change traditions. Well, we can. How many of you in the house today, and you don't have to raise your hands, but I know some of you are old enough to remember when a lot of primitive Baptist churches only met one Sunday a month. Now, I don't believe primitive Baptists ever did believe that you only needed to go to church one Sunday a month. But they would rotate from church to church to church. And, uh, and that, that was sort of out of necessity at one time because preachers were scarce, transportation was poor. And we have a number of churches today that don't have pastors right here in Alabama. And that's sad uh, indeed. But, but when a church can meet every Lord's Day in the same place, they ought to do that. Just because we didn't do it for a while doesn't mean that we have to continue meeting one Sunday a month. I have known churches that sung out of the old Lloyd hymnal, L-O-Y-D. I don't know how many of you all ever saw the Lloyd hymnal, but it was, uh, it was a good hymnal. It didn't have music in it. It just had the words. And some of the best singing I ever heard in my life in the Smoky Mountains was out of the old Lloyd hymnal. I'm telling you, those people could sing. But they thought that L-O-Y-D was like L-O-R-D. And if you tried to change the hymn book, you got in a lot of trouble with those folks. That's a, you're getting bogged down in tradition. I like the old school hymnal myself. I think it's a good hymn book. But listen, if this church voted to go to something else, I ought to be submissive to the church. Would you all agree with that? In other words, let's not get bogged down in some man-made tradition on the face of this earth. Now, uh, I'll give you an illustration about how, how traditions can rob us of blessings. One time this young couple got married, and uh, the husband went out one day, found a real good bargain on a, on a big ham, and he brought it home for his wife to cook. He loved ham, and so she cut two ends of it off and put it in this pot, this big pot. And he said to her, and she threw the rest away, and he said, why did you, why did you cut both ends of that ham off? That's where some of the best meat is. She said, I don't know why. That's the way my mama always cooked ham. She cut both ends off and put it in the pot. So, she went, uh, so he went to his mother-in-law and asked her, why do you do that? She said, I don't know, that's the way my mama cooked ham. <laughs> so he went to the older lady in the family and said, why, why would you cut two ends of a ham off in order to cook it? She said, because when I got married, I just had a small pot and it wouldn't hold the whole ham. <laughs> and that became a family tradition. And a lot of people missing out on a lot of good ham because of that simple tradition. Did you know that can happen in our lives? We can just do something out of tradition or habit when maybe it's, it's not the best thing to do. Now, if you go to a church, and, and Brother Josh is with us today. He's a young exercising minister for which we are deeply thankful. As far as I know, we don't have any other young preachers in the house today. By the way, if you ever feel a burden to preach and you want to talk to me about that, you're welcome to talk to me about it because our church appreciates young gifts and God calling men to preach. But you know, when a, when a young gift goes to a church 
and maybe they're bogged down in some tradition, uh, he's got to be patient with that church in order to make changes, right? Because you can't change people overnight. Believe me, I tried it. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. You can't change people overnight. Elder Mills said one time in North Carolina, if you're going to change the old Baptist, you better set about six or seven years uh, time frame to change them because they, they're like mud seals. <laughs> they don't move fast. And you know, it's a blessing in a way because if we had changed fast, we would have changed with the new school Baptists in the 1830s and lost the precious gospel. So, you know, we don't want to just jump on every change that comes along for the sake of change. We, we don't want to do that. But young preachers and even old preachers sometimes can go into a church and see things that need to be changed. And rather than prayerfully and lovingly and patiently working for change, uh, they go in like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> I knew one of them very, very close to me. Elder Bird called him a bulldozer. <laughs> I mean, he went into this church, he was going to clean it up overnight. And believe me, there were things that needed to be cleaned up and changed, but he did more damage than he did good. Are y'all getting this? Am I wasting my time this morning? Churches can get bogged down, even though they're sound in doctrine and practice and discipline in government, they can get bogged down in man-made traditions. And they just, uh, you know, they do not want to change. And, and, you know, and I'm a person that's slow to change. I had to be drugged into the high-tech world, I'll tell you. I remember when they first came out with car phones, I used to think how vain that is. To think you've got to ride around in a car with a phone in it. <laughs> People live for 6,000 years without car phones, surely we can I finally got my first car phone and I became hooked on it very quickly. And then they came out with the cell phones and I was so slow to change. And then smartphones. I was determined never to have a smartphone. But let me tell you, <laughs> they are wonderful. If you don't have one, you need one. <laughs> but it took me a while to get my eyes open. I'm, I'm slow to change. I don't like to change clothes. My good wife does, but I mean, she likes to change my clothes. I think that's true with most men and women. Now, you may be a man here today and just absolutely love with the latest styles, but, but I'm not in that group. I, I'm slow to change. The same tie and the same suit for 20 years would suit me fine. <laughs> I know y'all would like to have a cooler pastor than that. You'd like to have a hip pastor, right? <laughs> But you just stuck with me for whatever time you stuck with me. I don't even like to change furniture. My wife and I bought a hip table and chairs a few years ago. I mean, it was the latest thing. I mean, you just had to have one of these things. It was, the table was way up high. My feet wouldn't come near touching the floor. <laughs> I remember Elder Guy Hunt being at our house one time, and his feet wouldn't touch the floor, and he was about 6'4". <laughs> and I saw right then and there, it's time to get rid of this thing. <laughs> and we sold it to a gullible family in our church <laughs> who's cool. <laughs> but I don't, I don't like to change much. I, I, know, I'm, I'm, I know I get on people's nerves because I'm a little old-fashioned, but, but, but change is good. I mean, it, a smartphone, I can talk to the brethren in Africa. This morning I was texting, Brother, Brother Obey's son, Giff, call me from Tanzania. I can text with him instantly. Goodness, there's a lot of blessings. Electricity. I want to tell you, there's a lot of things that are changing that's good that, that uh, we want. But, but, and in the church, I want to talk a little about this and then we'll close this morning. The church doesn't want to get bogged down, but we want to grow. Don't we want to, grow? Don't we want to see the church grow? I do. Nothing thrills a church family any more than for people to join our church. I mean, 
Not because we're all about numbers, but because we love people and we love to see people come into the knowledge of salvation by God's amazing grace. I, I just, that nothing blesses me anymore than to see people converted to the truth of salvation by the grace of God. But we don't want to get all wrapped up in numbers because Jesus said to his church, he said, fear not little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Let's think about that verse a minute. Why did Jesus say that? Fear not, little flock. He did not say rejoice because you're a little flock. That would be a bad attitude. You know, we four and no more and that's all we want. That would be an awful attitude to have. No, we want to evangelize. We want to see our church grow. But Jesus knew knowing all things. He knew the church would never be a large number of people on this earth. And so he says to the little flock, don't fear because you're smaller than other orders. Do y'all get that? Y'all understand that? Our confidence is not in numbers, it's in God. And so Jesus said, fear not little flock, for it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I believe that is the church kingdom that we have here on the earth today. But we want to grow in numbers. And if you're here today and you love the Lord and you love Jesus Christ and you love salvation by grace and you love these people and you're looking for a home in the church, I want you to know the doors are wide open for reception today. Amen? We want to grow in numbers. And we also want to grow in love. I tried to explain last Sunday that without love, I don't care what we've got, we are a zero if we don't love one another in the house of God. I saw a woman some years ago whose husband had been cheating on her, and, and she, he was a well-to-do man. They lived in a mansion of a house, but she told me, she said, Brother Sam, I'd rather live in a tent by myself than to live with that man. What makes a home, really? It's not the brick and the mortar. Now, we all like comfortable houses. I do. I like air conditioning. I like central heating. Those things are fine. But I tell you what makes a home. Now, a house is made up of bricks and mortar and wood and furniture and all of that. But a home, there's a difference in a house and a home. And a home is made up of love. And that woman would have much rather moved out of that big mansion of a house and lived in a tent with a man that loved her. Do y'all hear me this morning? We want to grow in love in this house. If we don't love one another at Vestavia, we just play in church, that's all. You say, Brother Sam, you just don't know how hard it is for me to love some people. <laughs> you might be surprised how much I know <laughs> about how hard it is to love. And I imagine it's hard for some people to love me. I, I, <laughs> I look at me every morning in the mirror. I know. <laughs> I know I could be a challenge to anybody. I understand that. But let me tell you, Christian love is sacrificial love, right? And if you're just going to love those that love you back, even the pagans do that. We're to love people that are unlovable. And I can tell you, when you start loving people with the agape love from 1 Corinthians 13, it's amazing what that can do to somebody in their lives. And we want to grow in joy, don't we? The fruit of the Spirit is what we want to grow in. Joy. That's the second fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love is the first one. And by the way, these are fruit. These are not works of men you produce in your own efforts. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling in you that enables you to love, like I'm talking about this morning. And it's the Holy Spirit that enjoy, enables you to, to be joyful. How many of y'all this morning are absolutely joyful? I mean, you just enjoy waking up in the morning. <laughs> And it's good morning, Lord. And your heart is just overflowing with joy. I want to tell you, the Spirit of God 
can feel that. And I want our church services here to be uplifting and joyful. I don't want us to be practicing for a funeral here at Vestavia. I've been to churches where it looks like they were practicing for a funeral service in their worship. I've been to churches where it was so cold spiritually, you could ice skate in July right down the aisle. Are y'all listening to me? Now, folks, you're out there. Y'all are the ones that are going to have to love. <laughs> of course, I, I know I am too, and I want y'all to know I love you with all my heart. I do. This would be a, I'm going to tell you, we live in a crazy world, aren't we? We are living in one of the most awful times, I think, in American history and probably in world history. But the, the, but the unchanging church has helped to anchor me. I don't have to wonder about what makes up a marriage. I know what marriage is. It's between a man and a woman, right? Our country is confused about all of that. I know where life begins. It, it begins at conception. I don't have to wonder if it's not a viable human being until it's born. <laughs> The Word of God helps us to anchor ourselves in a changing world. You and I can be unchanging in the Word of God. I heard yesterday on a Christian radio station here in Birmingham, the, they had a panel of people from all over America, and they were talking about what has happened to America, how we have drifted into this wickedness and evil and immorality. And one man spoke up and said, it's not the Republicans, it's not the Democrats, it's not the Independents' fault, it's the church's fault and the pastor's fault because we've stopped teaching, thus saith the Lord. And we've watered down the message to get the crowds coming. Listen, I love the crowds, but brother, if you've got to water down the Word of God, you're going to end up with a nation that has, that has barnyard morals. Amen? Amen? Barnyard morals. Living like the animals. It's pitiful. Let's pray. I want to tell you, this church has been a blessing. It's been a blessing to me since I was a boy. I, was join I joined at 15, and I knew when I joined the church, they loved me. They made me feel loved, but I also knew I had to behave myself to be a part of that church. I needed that, and I benefited from that. So, people say, well, you know, Christianity is so boring. You know, you're so Puritan, you're so old-fashioned, you're so this, so that. I want to tell you what, when I wake up on Sunday morning, I'm not trying to get over a hangover. You know, they're legalizing marijuana now all over America. You think that, you know why they're doing that? Because there's no joy in America. And people trying to find a little in a weed, right? You don't have a problem in your life that marijuana can't make worse. Although some people will be getting rich from it. <laughs> you don't have a problem in your life that alcohol and drugs can't make a lot worse. Sin complicates life. Boy, we saw that, didn't we? In this presidential election. I don't like to use the word sex from the pulpit, but you know we are in the 21st century. I mean, if, if you took that sex out of the campaigns, there wouldn't be a lot else to talk about on both sides. And this Anthony Weiner, you talk about a pitiful embarrassment for a human being. A perverted man. Now, let me tell you, sin complicates life. You can, you can leave here today and say, Preacher, I don't, I'm not going to belong to a church that tells me how to live. I'm going to live the way I want to live. Well, go on out there and try it for a while and see how it works for you. God's way is the way to joy. I don't know anybody today that's behaving themselves in the Lord that's not joyful. And then peace. We want to grow in peace, don't we, in our church? We want to have peace one toward one another with God. 
long-suffering. These are things that we ought to be growing in as a people, as a church. Thank you all for your wonderful attention this morning. I appreciate so much your being here today and listening to me and my efforts to preach to you. And, and may God give us understanding as you consider what I've said today. We want to sing a hymn at this time. You have a... Thank you. 